Hi, I'm Lane Hartzell, and I'm here with David Rovix in Portland, Oregon, who is a musician and songwriter and also has written some recent articles in um, Counterpunch that we're going to talk about today. Hi, David. Hey, Lane. I wanted to uh, look at some of the writings that you've done related particularly to the uh, current conflicts in the U.S., uh, you know, con conflicts that are, are, they seem to be, well, they're, they're talked about as being race or the left and the right, um, feminism, um, social justice, and there's a lot of different terms that are thrown out there. So I want to talk about that with you. And then also about the democratic movements that we've seen throughout U.S. history that are, interestingly enough, not very much uh, talked about and, and, and massive ones like uh, Blair Mountain that we'll talk to talk about. The, uh, the, there's extreme sides, obviously, and um, it looks like to me that it's and, and to many that it's gotten to be uh, so extreme that it's um, the, the society is vir virtually breaking down, including you know, on January 6th was the, an uprising uh, violently to um, to interrupt the legal process of the society, which is, uh, you know, to elect the president, which is very uh, scary and illegal. Um, so I want to go into this with you uh, and get your views on this and also uh, um, what you're thinking about for a better society and some of the current projects you're working on. So let's start off with the terms. How do you see the right and the left and so forth? Yeah, that the whole right left thing is um I mean it's gone through a lot of uh evolution over the over the centuries and decades, I guess. But um traditionally, I guess it was always like the left was understood by many, including probably I'd say, you know, the overwhelming majority of the supporters of the left or people who consider themselves on the left, they would think of themselves as being uh, re representing the interests of the working class and the right, what, certainly from the perspective of the left, so uh, would be generally seen as representing the interests of the ruling class. And uh, of course, that's not how uh, the grassroots supporters of the right would have seen things necessarily, and and that's not how a lot of other folks would see things. But but of course this has all changed in the past few decades and this is you can hear it on the mainstream media talked about regularly about how the republicans are trying to position themselves as a party of the working class which would have sounded like a ridiculous notion a few decades ago but now it seems less ridiculous and the only reason it seems less ridiculous or the main reason is because the democrats basically abandoned the interests of the working class a long time ago when they embraced uh, basically big business and empire and, and you know these these free trade deals and all sorts of other stuff I and mean, you know this process that you could track down to at different points in history but certainly the you know many people would say the social contract that existed between uh, capital and and uh, labor and uh, it, that it was broken by the 1970s or certainly by the 80s yeah. and a trajectory very familiar to a lot of people in Europe where the where the timeline at least especially in England was was kind of similar with with the attack on uh, labor and the, and the the sort of collapse of uh of the of the labor movement to a large extent and in the u.s today you hear talk of even uh, democratic socialism so there's there's the trump um kind of right um that says the elites are oppressing us and on the other side there are on other sides there's the um the fact that the, the elites are oppressing us um and uh, we need democratic socialism. There's, there's, there, there is actually a similar, you, you write in your article, there's a similar view, right? They, both sides or all sides are saying we're being oppressed by the elites. But then you also, and, and of course, most people know about uh, Trump and so forth. What is this democratic socialism that's coming about? And, you know, principally with, say, Sanders, the squad and so forth. Well, I mean, the... Uh... The democratic socialist phenomenon in, in the U.S. has been one of the main hopeful uh, developments uh, in, in recent years, the growth of the, of the Democratic Socialist Party, but also of just the, the tendency within the Democratic Party, which, of course, is 
becoming um, stronger, I guess you could say, and especially during the pandemic, although um, it, that's very arguable whether that's really true or not, because I think we can see imperial policies of the empire, you know, continuing uh, under Biden, um, as any critic of Biden would have expected them to. Uh, so, you know, I, I but the, but the but the in terms of some of the domestic policies that are being enacted, you know, in terms of like ch child cr credit for ki kids and and health care uh, uh, policies and uh, the it, different re things related to housing, all the very temporary kind of like eviction moratoriums and stuff. I mean, these are these are all sort of the kinds of policies that uh, folks like Sanders and AOC have been advocating for a long time. So. I mean, and their voices are are being are, are loud and clear in in many ways. And and of course, when Sanders was running in 2016, the polls indicated that if the race came to him and uh, Trump, that uh, he would have won. And a lot of people are are uh, confused about that. And and if people are confused about that, it's probably because they are paying too much attention to one end of the media spectrum and not the other, or or they don't understand that people are joining the right-wing groups and the Republicans and, the, and become Trump followers or Proud Boys or any number of other kinds of things. They join these groups because of many, in many cases, the same kinds of motivations that makes people become campaigners for the Sanders campaign or something like that. I mean, they are looking for change and they're hearing candidates like Trump or Sanders or others talking about the working class, which is not normally something the Republicans are known for doing, but <clears throat> Trump did it every day when he was running for office, you know, which is why he which was one of the reasons why he gained uh, a, a significant working class following, you know, because he was actually talking about changing the, the, the trajectory in terms of like deindustrialization and stuff like that, you know, good jobs. Now he didn't talk much about unions, but he talked about you know, the jobs coming back and that sort of thing. Biden talks about unions, but doesn't make it very clear like what his program is for how, I mean, other than the green new deal, which is, which is a, if, if, and what, not that he's calling it that and that's, you know, but, but that's the sort of, thing they're trying to now uh i mean that's that's the sort of policies i guess they're trying to implement now if this mm -hmm. 3.5 trillion dollar thing oh, actually yeah. gets passed yeah that's that's coming up and i want to talk to you about the the evictions at the at the end as we get we look at more of your practical work because that's a very serious matter and it's i think it's just coming up in congress that they've they've relaxed that or something right or they allow for people to be thrown out well, this, the, uh, the, the, the CDC had an eviction moratorium that the Supreme Court uh, ultimately annulled, and, um, and Congress has failed to pass any new uh, real legislation that would do anything about the situation, uh, aside from uh, rental assistance, which is failing to get to the renters or to the landlords. In half the cases, they don't even know it exists. And you know, in the other half of the cases, it's just not getting where it needs to go. It's like 10% of it or something has actually gotten it to where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there, there, and, and it wasn't enough to begin with, but, uh, you know, considering the costs of housing and the, the crisis that already existed and predated the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is a really massive wave of evictions, um, coming up. Um, if, uh, action is not taken by the Congress or by, you know, I mean, what it, of course it depends on the state because in some states there, the uh, eviction moratorium has, is a local thing and it's, it, it extends to the end of the year, places like New York and Oregon. Right. And it's, of course it's getting cold there. It's, it's starting to get, uh, you know, well, it's autumn now, it'll be chilly, uh, you know, in uh, say Virginia um, and across on up. And then within say two months, uh, it could be some snow, uh, even down to that, to say Virginia and so forth. So from there on up, it's probably going to be really rough. And um, and this is uh, something that's certainly worth people looking into. And we'll get to it. Uh, going back to the, um, the de defining the terms, uh, the way that uh, socialist is used in the United States is really interesting because they 
the classical use of socialism is that workers own their work or the core that's the core of socialism could you just talk a little bit about that before we move into um, you know the history that you've been writing about the way that people use the term socialism in in the united states particularly in um like well not just among democratic socialist circles but also among other circles especially to the right of of the democratic socialists when they are characterizing uh, the democratic socialists you know they uh, they talk about socialism in 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 europe um and you know much of the rest of the world uh, it's not socialism to to just um, have basic government policies uh, involving the functioning of society. You know, it's just social. It's just basic social policy. It's what government does, like a public health sector. If it exists, if you have a public health sector, it, it's looking out for the health of the public. And, you know, like that's what it does. Like that's what a functional public health sector in a functional society does and and that's not in europe by european standards that's just considered a functional government that's not considered mm -hmm. socialism and uh socialism right is, I'm, uh, I'm in you know i'm in berlin more impressive you know right i'm in berlin and in, in northern europe right now and yeah. you know if you go here on up around there's there's the capitalism is quite vibrant and yet yeah. there's this whole social policy project that you're talking about yeah, and I think doesn't Merkel call it uh, the market? Uh, does he call it market socialism or social capitalism? I don't know, but there's different terms and how I don't know how they're translated necessarily. But these yeah. are just normal terms and normal understandings, and not contradictory in any kind of fundamental way. The way that they would be thought of by much of American society, like oh, we can't have you know somehow if if the government is involved it was paving the roads then you know that that's going to lead to the gulags or something i mean it's just bizarre kind of thinking it's hard to even kind of you know get your head around because it's it it all involves a century of anti-communist propaganda that never made a whole lot of sense in the first place you know but when you've been swallowing this stuff generation after generation and it never made much sense in the first place you know now it's gotten to where you know these words are just you know they're just meaningless words that mean evil you know they don't mean anything right. to people here in any kind of like way that they can explain you know and so moving from this which is really excellent understanding uh for the for the terms into uh you you took up the a uh, hundred years ago there was an uprising and, and in fact um there were uh, there was a number of things going on at the time from say um, 1917 on up to 1921 and so forth. Uh, I want to get into this because this aspect of history is is really important and yet it's not um, we don't hear much about it. So uh, you write that uh, at at Blair Mountain there was an uprising. Um, uh, we had a hundredth anniversary recently, and you say that you know American citizens should know with this history. Can you talk more about this? It's it's a really long-standing problem uh, that um, to take the example of of uh, our public television network here, PBS and National Public Radio. It really it goes back to the founding of these networks that they have been systematically, intentionally uh, ignoring labor history. And it's not at all unique to those networks, but I have a lot of dirt on those networks um, in particular. But it's clearly uh, also the case with uh, CNN and all the other major networks. They just don't want to talk about labor history. They don't want to talk about class and they don't want to talk about the, what the working class has in common because these 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 entities that run our media as well as the ones that run our educational uh, framework and uh you know they're not neutral and uh they have an they have a political agenda and it is to uh serve the interests of the ruling class in this country and mm -hmm. uh they can't let the working class know that it exists in order to, to effectively serve the working the ruling class you can't let the people know that they are a, a people and you have to keep them divided and so 
so and and this is very i'm i'm simplifying things and 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 it's and it's a very complicated uh phenomena but but you know and we do have a, this this massive uh, real ongoing history of white supremacy in this country and racism and and this and racism and uh other forms of discrimination are uh, but particularly racism is fundamental to the economic economics and to uh, the, the society and ha has been for 500 years and that cannot be really overstated but uh while not w without overstating uh the, the 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 realities of of white supremacy uh if you at the same time as you're talking about the pogrom in tulsa oklahoma that they call the the the, the uh, tulsa race massacre and these other things that that have been largely written out of history but have been talked about a lot in the media over the past few months if you're going to talk about things like the Tulsa Race Massacre and not talk about things like the Battle of Blair Mountain, which happened to have, it, it, it occurred only three months later, during the same year, 100 years ago, in 1921, uh, in the same year after of, of the Tulsa Race Massacre, which in case people haven't heard of it, is when uh, white mobs descended upon a black neighborhood in Tulsa and burned it to the ground, killed hundreds of people, and and uh, caught, created thousands of refugees. And that's just the, the beginning of, of the tragedy that took place there. But uh, three months later in West Virginia, you had a, an uprising which is being talked about a little bit in the media today because it's the centenary of it but even when it's talked about in the media the relevance of it in terms of race is not mentioned and and that's all that's also tragic and and bizarre but the fact is that this uprising 100 years ago in west virginia was the biggest armed uprising in the history of this country and it was a, a multiracial uprising there were, of the 15,000 participants, 2,000 of them were black, and, and which is more or less about what the kind of proportions would have been in terms of the coal mines. And so it's not surprising that this was the case. Um, and, when you, and let me, you know, let me interject that, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, also Native American women, a large amount were, were involved in these actions too. Uh, we're talking about the in, whole in, in society, the Oklahoma, right? In the Green Corn Uprising in Oklahoma. In Green Corn, uh, in, in, yes. Uh, certainly in 1917, there was a very significant, and of course, this is Oklahoma, which is which which had a, which had and has a, a very significant Native mm -hmm. uh, population, uh, of course, because historically so many tribes were were, were, were forcibly uh, moved to Oklahoma. But um, yeah, Oklahoma, the the Green Corn Uprising is a is a cross intersectional. You know, uprising involving people of all backgrounds, race and, and gender, and, and including prominent Native American f women leadership. Yeah. The, so the, the both of these, uh, you know, large events in history, you know, of course, the, the race massacre in Tulsa, we know we know something about because it has gotten some attention here in recent years. Uh, and then there's the 1619 project and so forth. And when the boat showed up in uh, Yorktown, which started off the, you know, the slavery and so forth. I think it was about yeah. 20 slaves on that ship. Now, if if the uh, conditions, say, for example, that you described, and I th and think you're correct, that the uh, one side is saying that uh, the elites are oppressing us and Trump is going to uh, set us free from it. And then you have another side that says that the elites are oppressing us and we need social democracy. Uh, and then there's other elements. There's some extreme elements in here too, like we, you know, left and right. So, so anyway, I think that uh, perhaps what I'm, what I'm hearing or what I'm reading is that, uh, that race has something to do with the, uh, how, how the interpretations are coming about, even though they have the same, right. They see the same, I guess you, they're getting the same uh, picture. Of, of the of the big picture, but when they move to enact some kind of change, then it goes along race lines. Is this correct? I mean, I would say that it it it's so much of it comes down to 
you see that there's a lot of inequality in around you and you see that there, there's these elites that are that are getting richer and r ruling everything and everything is getting more expensive and, and you see this reality happening around you whoever you are in this society if you're from the working class and then but then you might draw very different conclusions about why all this is happening and I think that's the main difference um, between the right and the left, actually, when it comes down to it in this country, regardless of the propaganda of both the right and left in terms of who the other is. Uh, I think that is really what, what it comes down to is you have a different explanation and for, for what who's oppressing you and for, for the for the left. Um, I mean, I don't I don't I mean, what we call the left today, I don't know exactly what their explanation is. And I, I'm not sure I'm a part of that left necessarily. But the class oriented left of which I am a part, uh, understands um, that those who are oppressing us are uh, the ruling class, which is the, 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 the extremely wealthy people who are basically conspiring to maintain their extreme wealth and maintain the extreme inequality. And they do this through corrupt mechanisms within uh, the legal framework of our democratic system and, um, and, and through other extra legal means of all kinds. But um, but the right wing, when they look at that elite, um, they may or may not see, uh, or they, you know, they may see the, the same corporate, uh, well, you know, power and uh, and, and political influence. Um, but behind it, uh, rather than seeing um, basically uh, plutocrats uh, of of all kinds, um, they see particular kinds of plutocrats, specifically Jewish plutocrats. And uh, and they see um, the they see that uh, race is used as a tool to keep them oppressed in their view, and the people doing that oppressing in their view somehow or other are black and brown people. I don't know how they make all the all how they do all the mental gymnastics to come up with this kind of formula that that their enemy uh, their their enemies are 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 Jews and and blacks you know it's a very complex and bizarre you know i mean especially i mean it's all really bizarre but at least you can find a fair number of jewish capitalists if you want to vilify jews you know how they can come up with uh you know that they're being oppressed by black people who are overwhelmingly obviously uh living in poverty in this society is hard to really get my head around but this has been going on for a long time the division of the races by the ruling class and it's been very effective divide and conquer and we you know you have so many poor people from b b black and and white backgrounds living in their own separate ghettos and you know one neighborhood it's is a trailer park and another it's crumbling apartment blocks and mm. they're all paying the same rent because their, their rent is determined by uh, their uh, fixed incomes on disability and they all get the same fixed income with the poor i mean you know and that's what they pay in, in the place in the trailer parks and the and the housing projects in milwaukee because that's what the landlords can get away with you know mm -hmm. and it's been like that for a very long time this this underlying theme of your of your writings then would be that uh, the let me try to put it this way if 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 that connection were to be made based on a human level that people actually were and in a lot of U.S. history is this coming together of people that is U.S. history and in, in fact the Constitution around the, the certain you know the best uh, principles of the Constitution. Uh, did create the United States with these particular, uh, what, what I would say, good elements, right? The, and, and productive elements. I mean, you know, building the country and so forth. And I do want to mention the Chinese, of course, that were brought in. But yeah, I mean, this is a this is an interesting history. And if this could be bridged, then uh, maybe there uh, more progress could be done. I mean, is this something that yeah. you see? Is this? Absolutely. And, and then, you know, even just mentioning the Constitution, it's it's uh, it's so relevant to mention that the best part of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. Most people would say I would, too. 
and uh, and the Bill of Rights uh, got passed because of a uh, rebellion. And uh, you know, after the American Revolution, uh, th there was the, the the farmers of Western Massachusetts, uh, the, the tenant farm farmers, because most farmers weren't at that time were not you know landowners. They were they were renting farmland from some rich English person or rich Dutch person, depending, or some other rich person. But they uh, the the tenant farmers of Western Massachusetts who had been off fighting and dying in the revolution uh, during the time that they were away, uh, the, the landlords wanted rent for the farms that they were not able to work on while they were off fighting in the Continental Army. And uh, basically, to, to make a long story short, they rebelled and they took over the state for several years and went or the western part of the state. And uh, and when the rebellion w was put down, uh, as it ultimately was, uh, that's when the Bill of Rights uh, came around as a direct reaction to Shay's rebellion, as a as a uh, way of saying, okay, this we need to give these people something more than what they uh, got because they think they were fighting for freedom and democracy, and all we've given them is a new monarch. This goes back to even. Um to James Madison, who initially, of course, he wrote that um, if we uh, if we distribute the land or, or if we allow people to have the vote, if we have actual democracy, people are going to call for the distribution of the land. Right. Shay's rebellion rebellion came later with the actual exactly. uh, Bill of Rights. These were not easily. Uh, um, how should we say it achieved? And we never got any distribution of the land, really. I mean, we got the Homestead Act, which was a much better than the Bill of Rights in terms of any kind of distribution of land. Of course, the Bill of Rights was all about things unrelated to economics, basically, you know, speech and, and uh, you know, of course, the Constitution's kind of biggest failing is that it's not about uh, property, right, the rights to 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 uh, land and and uh, and food and health care, any of that kind of stuff. It's it's uh, you know this this the right to happiness is a hell of a lot more uh, obscure than the right to property, which was originally going to be in the document, but that was omitted later and replaced with. The, I mean, of course, that's just in the preamble, right? Which isn't legally binding anyway. But uh, what is it? The the right to pro uh, life, liberty, and property was originally in the thing, mm -hmm. which you know might sound kind of like. Uh, oh, property! It's you know property. You know, for a lot of a lot of knee-jerk anarchists out there, I think you know property is theft. You know, well, you know property. No, property. That's what we want. That's what we want is land. We want the land distributed. You know, it's theft when you steal it from everybody, but it's not theft when right. you distribute it properly. You know, right? Yeah, I mean exactly what Madison. I mean, the anarchists should re should read Madison, right, to understand uh, what, sure. what's going on. Sure. The uh, this is this is an interesting history uh, discussion, and I think that it could really be helpful for you know people listening in. The uh, when we hear about uh, a genocidal kind of um, initial kind of infant empire, what uh, Washington called the United States, we, we hear hear a lot about genocide. Of course, there was a there was a war, and then the Constitutional Convention, and then later a civil war. This whole history. A lot, a lot of people that are so in social justice or they claim social justice or whatever, you know, they look at this history as if the United States is all genocide, all internal conflict, internal war. But, but that's not true, right? And this is what you are getting at with your piece. Absolutely. It's it's too complicated to to, to, to sum it up like it's all genocide. It's a ridiculous, a ridiculous orientation. The United States is a settler colonial country. And, uh, and and it was set up on the basis of settler colonialism. And, and settler colonialism is a system that involves taking people who want to flee or leave their homelands for one reason or another and making them settle another land and displace people and exploit the land and exploit other people for the profit of the colonizing power which you know in it which was the british empire british. the dutch empire and later you know the the american uh independent sovereign state of the united states uh you know building its empire on its own and and with you know so and, and who are the shock troops of settler colonialism 
you know, they're they're what they're what we call the in the doctrine of of subtle colonialism. They're the immigrants who are seeking a better life and wanting to be pioneers to forge uh, Western civilization in the terra nullis of uh, you know the West. You know, but of course, who they really are in at least ninety percent of the cases, by my informal estimation are refugees and uh, they were european refugees because primarily because refugees weren't even allowed from most of the world uh, you know with the exception of those who were you know under contract from china and japan and and you know there, there's a lot of other exceptions but but generally if you wanted to immigrate you know your the, the standard for being able to immigrate was to be european and because uh, we had the whites only European uh, whites only immigration policy in this country, which Australia and New Zealand and other settler colonial countries, Canada also had. And that only changed, um, you know, in the 20th century. And there were all sorts of laws in the immigration policy that were specifically targeting Southern Europeans and Eastern Europeans. So it wasn't even just a whites only uh, immigration policy. It was very much a Western European immigration policy with very favored Western European immigration. But even among those Western European immigrants, you know, or the Central or Eastern immigrants from Europe who largely populated, who made up the settler population of this settler colonial country, even among them, they were mostly refugees, and if if you if you trace your own family history, generally mm -hmm. most people will find that you're descended from refugees. Okay. And there's a, for a lot of reasons why we changed that narrative. A lot of different, you know, in the, the official officially and unofficially in all kinds of different ways. So of course that that refugee narrative has been changed, and and now we're you know we're all immigrants who came seeking a better life, and we 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 didn't uh, leave because we were fleeing war and pogroms and and famine and and monarchy and torture. But that's what we were doing. We refugees. We 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 people descended from European refugees. And so then we are told that, uh, you know, all this is that the, all the inequality in this society is basically, you know, rooted in in uh, in this formula of um, wh white privilege relative to the um, oppression of the rest of the population. Um, and uh, and that's ridiculous because I mean, this is a this is a population that's been divided and conquered, and uh, and some people are privileged relative to others in that process of dividing and conquered conquering, and that's classic colonial practice, and people have to understand basic classic colonial practice. If you're going to say that uh, you know because of uh, it's the settler colonial system white people are somehow all uh, the enemy not to not to you know that would be way oversimplifying to 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 say that anybody is proposing that but but just to oversimplify i mean it's like the 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 sunni people in iraq are not the enemy either you know uh the the um the uh the tutsi people in uh rwanda are not the rwanda. enemy you know I mean, it's uh, these were these were divisions. You know, the Protestants in Ireland are not the enemy. These were divisions that were created, uh, and and then you know, and then if you're going to just perpetuate these divisions by uh, by embracing the very ideas that the col colonial powers put out there, but the superiority of these minorities that the colonial powers or majorities in the case of white people in the united states that the colonial powers use to keep everybody else down you know everybody has to understand that dynamic and mm -hmm. and and if you if you just embrace the very misunderstanding of reality that the colonial powers are handing us about the superiority of one group over another and and in some way or another you don't embrace the the idea that this this group is superior but you embrace the idea that uh that the that the problems in society are all about these divisions that have been created for us right well that's just uh really defeatist and and also inaccurate in, in your work as a musician uh, let me ask you some more more personal experience you're writing about this solidarity that you speak of 
um, indigenous women's leaders at the uh, Korean Corn Rebellion, the, uh, the black um, uh, soldiers uh, and the, um, what was it, 2,000 black soldiers along with 13,000 white soldiers in, in, a, in the most um, important uprising uh, 100 years ago. And also that was organized by a, a union, working class union, right? Well, the um, in uh, the the Green Corn Uprising in in uh, Oklahoma, the working class union was the uh, the secret organization okay. that had been engaged actually in a campaign of of, of sabotage for years prior to mm -hmm. this uh, att abortive attempted march on Washington. But in 1921, the Battle of Blair Mountain, uh, yeah, it was. Um, it, it it was a it was a, a massive event, but it was it was not organized by the union. It was organized okay. by uh, union workers, and actually the union itself, the union leadership, uh, was beseeching the workers to abandon their march uh, because they were afraid they'd be you know slaughtered. Uh, yeah. You know, but people were just so outraged by the slaughter of women and children by um, uh, you know firing into the tent camps of striking miners. Uh, by the gun thugs employed by the companies, uh, and and uh, Mother Jones and other um, UMWA uh, United Mine Workers uh, uh, organizers had been uh, successfully getting the marchers uh, to turn around and go home, and then there was a massacre of women and children in the town of Sharples, West Virginia, uh, by the Pinkerton gun thugs, and uh, the marchers uh, heard about that and they just turned back around and continued on it towards Mingo. If you're writing about this kind of history, and yet you go to, um, uh, you're supposed to give a talk or, uh, uh, or play a gig, and then all of a sudden you find out that you've been uh, deplatformed. Um, you know, of course, this, this certainly feels, um, I mean, it's a difficult thing individually. Uh, but also socially, this is creating a kind of um, even, I would say, totalitarian uh, stream going on. And, and a lot of this is coming from people who are espousing the very things that you're talking about, or they say they espouse it. What, what is this kind of um, schizophrenic uh, kind of, you know, I'll let you handle it there. What do you think? I mean, one thing, I think that has to be understood about the whole deplatforming idea is that this is not new and and this did not just start with the um sort of more fanatical elements of the movement that has been going on past for the past couple of years it also did not start with um the battles in the streets of Portland and cities around North America, Europe and elsewhere during the 80s around the um, the whole that sort of Nazi skinhead uh, and opposition mm -hmm. to the Nazi skinhead movement. I mean, that it, this this goes way, way back. Um, certainly in the 1930s, uh, it was a big thing, uh, you know, sort of platforming and, and the, the idea of, of fascists not having a platform to to organize anywhere. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to try to summarize a complex history and say think one thing was right or wrong. It's complex and it varies from place to place. And but overall, generally, I'd say that the deplatforming idea uh has been more of a problem that, you know has, has been more of a totalitarian tendency that is very problematic uh rather than anything positive you know basically it's been bad and it has been bad for a very long time and it was bad it was a bad idea in the 1930s generally too i don't think that you're gonna i think that the the, the you only give uh, people more power when, when you try to ban them and when you block them. And, and that's not just true for the state censoring people, um, which they are, which I think the state it generally is very careful about not needing to censor people because they, because you don't get to get on the radio or TV unless you're already, you know, being promoted by a massive corporation in the first place, mm -hmm. you know, most of the time. So, that effectively censors most people, you know, without needing to actually censor people because censorship doesn't work. You know, censorship just makes people famous, uh, you know, unless you can do it 
really, really well. Like, you know, just make people disappear into the bowels of your prison and system they never well, heard from again. It's, I mean, but, but it's interesting know. what you're talking about here because Noam Chomsky was doing an interview with the BBC and the 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 young man said to Noam, he said, Well, I, I say what I want. And I, I'm I'm a journalist. And Noam said you wouldn't be sitting there if you didn't uh already think that. Can you just make a just quick comment on this particular exchange? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, the the idea that a BBC journalist says what they want. I mean, yeah, what they wouldn't be working there if they didn't already see the BBC as some kind of a objective journalistic entity that they want to help improve by working for them. And, and they, or at least they wouldn't uh, put forth a, a different opinion than that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be working for the BBC very long. I mean, so the, the position is ridiculous. I mean, if you had the opinion of the BBC that a lot of people have who work for, uh, I don't know, press TV in Iran, you know, they wouldn't be employing you at the BBC for very long, I'm pretty sure. You'd, you'd end up washing the toilets pretty quick, you know, rather than doing anything with a microphone. So, so this process of censorship you're talking about is a selection process they're already selecting people that already have a particular ideology. But when the young person gets there, they think, oh, I have a great job. I'm, I get to say what I want. Yeah, and that is a very, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting, the whole selection process that like that, how that happens, um, because it is, uh, it, you know, it's not like so simple, like, you know, you have to think this way and then we'll give mm -hmm. you a job. Right. You know, it's it's more complex, but... Right. You know, it, it's a selection process that starts at birth and it um, continues on to private schools or what in England they call public schools. But, you know, it, it, you, you go to a private academies, uh, you know, with, with the cream of the crop, the top 10% of the society, and then you go to an Ivy League college after that. And then, you know, then, then you, you know, you, you, you apply for your job at BBC, you know, you don't do it otherwise. You don't, you don't, you don't go to a community college and then apply for a job at BBC. You won't, you're, you know, you're not going to get that job. And, and uh, you know, so you don't even try. And if you do, you don't get hired, you know, so mm -hmm. it's the Ivy League uh, graduates who went to the private schools, which is why they got into the Ivy League in the first place. So in order to go to all those schools in the first place, they already had to have grown up in one of the richest parts of the country, you know, like they, they already grew up in a county like the one I grew up in, in Fairfield County, Connecticut, or Westchester County, New York. They already have a totally skewed perspective on reality based on privilege and growing up with privilege and then living a relatively privileged life up until the time they get their job at BBC. And that might be the first time they have to deal with uh, like, I don't know. I mean, depending on the person, I mean, that, that might be the, the least privileged situation they get into when, by the time they get the job at BBC and realize it doesn't pay all that well compared to how expensive it is to live in London, you know? Right. But, these days. Yeah. The, the, um, the society that you uh, would like to see, you wrote a song about this. Um, I call it a Star Trek society or, you know, some kind of advanced technical echo society. Uh, what, what would you like to see? I mean, I, I'm really flexible, ecumenical, open <laughs> about, uh, you know, that I'd just like to see a society where the air continues to be breathable and, you know, where, where the, you know, the, the food grows and the water can be drunk. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're at such a, such a, such a crossroads here with uh, existential crossroads that I'd be just happy with uh, if the solution is going to be te high tech or primitivist or anywhere in between, I'm up for it, you know, as long <laughs> as we can survive. And you know, I would love to see a future where you don't have, uh, you know, half the human race, uh, you know, suffering uh, in, in with, with uh, war and poverty and disease. And, you know, I mean, it'd be, what is it? 40, percent of people in, in this country um, don't know what they would, you know, basically a, an emergency involving more than a few hundred dollars is something they are not in any position to deal with, you know, yes, yes. one in four children goes to bed hungry in this country. I'd like to see mm -hmm. a society where those things are not the norm, mm -hmm. but, I, but how that happens, I mean, it could go, it, it could be achieved in lots of different ways. And I, I'm not a, 
ideologue, and I and I don't think that there's only one way forward in terms of achieving uh, some kind of uh, egalitarian society. And actually, you know, I get in a lot of arguments or discussions with a lot of people about this because I think, for, I think partly it's really it's really helpful to travel, and a lot of people don't travel because they can't afford to or whatever. But it's really helpful to travel, and and if you have at least for me, I would say if you've spent a lot of time in Scandinavia and you've spent a lot of time in the U.S., you know, and I've spent a lot of time in other, a lot of other countries, but just contrasting those places with each other, you know, you don't need to, it, it, you can see easily in places like Denmark or even, you know, in lots of other countries in Europe that aren't as well run as Denmark that you don't need to have, um, you know, like some kind of radical socialist solution or anarchist or I mean, you can just there, it would be a, such a massive improvement on th things as they are here. If we could just have really basic European standards of uh, governance, like if we had, you know, any kind of like democratic system where there were really actually more than two parties, you know, that that where that didn't both think we should spend half of our taxes on the military, you know, we don't really have a democracy here. It's, it's our main problem. And if we could have some kind of a democracy, like by you know, like they have in Europe, then things would have naturally improved dramatically because you you can only have such a dysfunctional society without democracy. I mean, mm -hmm. the level of dysfunctionality here is only possible without democracy. I mean, because there is no democracy in the world anywhere uh, where where you would find uh, a a population interested in voting for a party that wants to spend half of your taxes on the military. There's mm -hmm. none anywhere. The only time that you can have a democracy where where anyone will vote for a party that wants to spend half of your taxes on the military is when both major parties want to spend half your taxes on the military. That's the only time that it happens anywhere. There's no mm. examples anywhere in the world now or historically of a majority of a population voting for a party that wants to spend half your money on the military when there is a viable alternative in a multi-party system. It's never happened. It only happens here. Yeah, and you, you're working on the this current housing crisis, which could use some money, right, from the um, 3.5 trillion that's coming about. Uh, let me ask you, of course, at Blair Mountain, they didn't have open source and apps and phones. They had, they basically were forced into a situation where they, all they had was guns, right? The only kind of technology. But in the case of uh, what you're doing and what you see uh, people doing in the United States all over, because you're traveling and, and, um, and talking with folks and singing and sharing, uh, what what do you think um, is possible? What's going on, and so forth? I mean, it seems to me that the situation with technology is is, is so dismal. I mean, b with uh, because as it seemed so hopeful in the nineties, uh, and uh, it the cypherpunks and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, and and just the freedom of the internet, and and this the fact that it was this open source, free, you know, and it's it is, but but uh, you know, it's been so much uh, successfully taken over by certain high, big tech uh, corporations uh, through means now familiar to most people. But uh, the internet isn't the internet anymore, right? It's largely for most people, it's a collection of massive corporations that are sucking up all your data and using them to dominate the world. And, um, you know, so I, what I see in terms of anti-social media, which is where most people spend most of their time online, it seems, if they're not like buying stuff on Amazon or viewing porn, you know, <laughs> It's uh, it, it's just it's just causing uh, the the further dissolution of society. I, I think it's the one of the main causes of it, really. And and all people seem to do on those platforms is argue with each other, and and that's built into the whole algorithms of the platforms and how they work. You you just it's just Facebook makes it really impossible to do any effective organizing on their platform. I mean, Facebook is really just good for for you know sensational news consumption and arguing and it, it'll make sure to promote posts that will promote arguments and it won't and, and nobody's going to see the link to your 
essay, you know, that, mm -hmm. that really explains your points. And if they do see it, they're not going to click on it, but uh, they're probably not going to see it in the first place because, you know, it's a, it's a link, you know, mm -hmm. takes you off of the platform. And, you know, it's just such a mess. So, I mean, I think there's reason to be optimistic about technology, potentially uh, some technologies, but uh, the, the dominant uh, technology of social media that is, you know, taking up so much of our time and energy, it's overwhelmingly negative impact, I'd say. In, in the case of the, I agree, for Facebook, for, for well, TikTok and so forth, uh, for the activists, are they writing their own apps or what What are they using? I mean, what kinds of technology are they using? Maybe Zoom for organizing or maybe writing some apps or? I mean, I think there's, there. when we come into this whole I mean, I think certainly in, in among uh, you know technologically savvy activist types, there's all all kinds of uh, you know app uh, creation and programming of all kinds going on, and creating all kinds of uh, different alternative platforms, and and certainly within the music uh world uh there's there's lots of organizing around around uh trying to create alternatives to the sort of vulture capitalist model of spotify and you know. oh yeah that's right but there's some the, new ones i see coming about right that artists are using there are but the problem is there with any of these alternatives in whatever uh forum whether it's music or organizing or any number of communication social media is a great example you know, it only becomes useful if a lot of other people are doing it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if everybody's still on Spotify or everyone's still on Facebook, then your alternative platforms aren't going to really do much. And, you know, you can't organize if nobody's on the platform to organize and, and you're not going to make money streaming uh, music to people that aren't there to listen to it. So, you know, the the once you've got an infrastructure where the super highway is called Facebook and Spotify, you know, then you need to use the infrastructure and, and you need to, um, you need to uh, fight to, to control it, uh, because mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to go away. And, and you're not going to convince everybody to, to get their flashlights out and take the cow path instead of the highway, you know, when mm -hmm. they already got their cars, and they're all ready, you know, to drive and go fast. And, you know, it's just, it's just uh, the way it is, they, they got the you know they got the means and 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 we need to we need to take them on uh, i think uh, somehow but uh mm -hmm. it's i don't think uh, i mean and creating alternative models is is a good thing but and and, and, a, and a necessary thing but it's the same as organizing in the in the in the physical world i mean you know we we can it's important to have all organic farms that show uh, everybody that you don't need pesticides but that's not going to make all the pesticide farmers uh, convert to organic farming it, it, mm -hmm. you, you need a much bigger effort than that that needs to be systemic not just uh, you know somebody uh, you know designing an app or starting up a farm mm -hmm. there there're more um technology's not going to solve it but it can be a, a accessory to help oh yeah Big time. in closing for your efforts there uh, in the communities around you in oregon um in, in portland you said uh, in a previous conversation that it, it's dire situation uh, people are going to lose their homes uh, can you talk a little bit about that before we close here yeah i mean portland Portland is, it's all, it's, it's all very contradictory, but Portland is, as a city, the most rent burdened city in the United States in terms mm -hmm. of the income, uh, average income relative to average cost of monthly uh, rent or mortgage. So, um, but uh, it's also within the state of Oregon, which is these days one of the more progressive states when it comes to um, policies related to you know most everything so um even though it's a very expensive place to live and increasingly expensive and and the government uh intentionally takes very little uh, you know are you still there i'm here because oh okay my you just disappeared from my screen for a moment but now you're back um, and the government here takes a very little, um, you know, it really, really takes a hands-off policy uh, to 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 uh, housing market, which basically means it's uh, you know it's up to the capitalists to do what they want. Um, but um, but 
because there's a uh, relatively progressive uh, state government, the, we have the moratorium that extends to the end of the year. So it's not going to become a crisis. They're, they're, they're kicking the can down the road uh, here mm -hmm. uh, better than they are in most parts of the country. But wherever they're, but that's all they're doing is kicking the can down the road. And eventually there's going to be a, a major crisis. But possibly in at least this state anyway, they may avert the crisis until the aid money that's out there actually gets disper dispersed, which would make sense. That would be like a sort of functional thing for a government to do, right? But in other states, they have, um, there is no more moratorium. Uh, the aid money is not reaching the renters and the eviction waves of eviction have begun are, and they are very much happening in process right now, in progress right now, uh, in, in a lot of places like in Georgia, Alabama, Texas, and a lot of places. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, add links to your articles and to this effort that you have for the uh, evictions and so forth uh, down, down below. Uh, David Rovix, thank you very much for talking with me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Lane. It's been a pleasure.